This week on the show, we have American actress Emily Swallow, who plays the armorer in the Star Wars series, The Mandalorian. You are too young to join them. All in good time. Come, Grogu. If you wish to become a Mandalorian, there is much work to attend to. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show's all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of understanding that getting uncomfortable is the only way we learn and grow. The reality is when we are too comfortable in any area of our life, whether it's our careers, relationships, or how we spend our time, we tend to not put in as much effort because we begin to take those things for granted with the expectation that it will always remain the same. But the moment we get uncomfortable or a situation makes us rethink and question that stability is the moment we snap into action and put the effort in to keep and nurture those precious areas in our life. This is why it's imperative to make it a point to never get complacent or take things for granted. It's also a reminder to take on tasks or make decisions based on its value, opposed to avoiding it because it's outside our comfort zone. Ironically enough, it's only when we are put in a position that is completely outside of our comfort zone that we truly expand and are forced to grow. Make your mission today to embrace stepping out of your comfort zone and getting temporarily uncomfortable as a means of growing and evolving into the best version of yourself. As Jason Reynolds quotes, be not afraid of discomfort. If you can't put yourself in a situation where you are uncomfortable, then you will never grow, you will never change, you'll never learn. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break, let's talk about the Mandalorian. Fast forward today as your role as the armorer. Um, let's talk about the significance of your role as we see her more in uh, season three. Yes, um, I was thrilled when I, I found out what was going to be happening in season three and that she'd be turning up more. And I think that it was so powerful to have her be a part of this continued growth of the Mandalorian people and the continued exploration of these questions about, you know, what is the way? And, uh, and do you have to have all of the external trappings in order to really walk the way? And I love that they used a character like that to show that compromise is possible. That was one of the most powerful things to me about this season. Um, it was I mean, it was so much fun for me to be able to be more involved with Din Djarin's journey and to get to interact with Grogu and get to team up with Bo-Katan. But at the core of it all, I just was so appreciative that they showed this willingness to compromise because I think, um, I mean, I think that that's something that we need to, to see exemplified in any form that we can. And even though it might be a story about this group of Mandalorians on a distant planet, you know, in a galaxy far, far away, there's still so much resonance for what we're going through as a society and in, in our culture right now. So it's always exciting to be part of storytelling like that. Wardrobe provided by Le Chateau. Next up on the show, we have American actress Emily Swallow, who plays the armorer in the Star Wars series, The Mandalorian, alongside Pedro Pascal. Emily, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm a big fan of The Mandalorian, so we got to talk about it. But before we get into all of that, let's talk about you and how you got your start. I know you got your start in theater and Broadway. So tell us about that period in your life and how it shaped you into the actress you are today. Yes, I did start uh, with theater. I did. I mean, I, I performed all through my childhood and in high school and, and uh, didn't know for a while that it was going to be a career because I was just interested in so many other things. Um, and when I was an undergrad at the University of Virginia, I was sort of splitting my time between the drama department where I was not a major, but I they are wonderfully accessible and have a lot of people who contribute to productions, whether or not you're majoring. Um, I was doing that with half my time and my major, which was Middle Eastern Studies, with the other half of my time. 
And uh, I had a very understanding thesis advisor who was supportive of, <laughs> of all of my performances, even when I was supposed to be writing my Middle Eastern Studies thesis. Um, and I had a few wonderful acting teachers who did encourage me to pursue it professionally. And so I worked up, I think I had a dozen monologues ready to go at the drop of a hat. And I went and auditioned for various graduate acting programs and conservatories. And I wound up at NYU um, at Tisch School of the Arts. And it was incredible to get to be in New York City, getting to know that city and getting to know that theater community while I was in school doing this training, because it meant that when I graduated and did my showcase, it wasn't quite as daunting to sort of dive into this world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did, I, I, I loved, I still love theater. And I thought at first that that was all I wanted to do, but then I started to dabble a bit in various television productions. Um, and uh, I never really anticipated that I would be using mask training that I had done in theater to be in a Star Wars TV show. That's definitely not something I could have predicted, but I, I love it when things work out that way. You just prepare and you don't know what opportunities will present themselves. Yeah, it just shows everything happens for a reason, right? Every experience in mm -hmm. your life kind of leads you to where you are. And it's actually interesting when you connect the dots and see where it leads you. But I want to talk about your diverse portfolio. Uh, you've been in the, the Lucky Ones to Guiding Light to the TNT medical drama Monday Mornings, just to name a few roles. So what's been your biggest or favorite career highlight and why? Oh, golly, I am <laughs> no good at answering questions about favorites because there's been so many wonderful things that I've loved. Um, on stage, I would say there was a, a production that I got to do in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Guthrie Theater with Mark Rylance, who is just one of my favorite actors and creators. And uh, I got to be in a play that he was in and he was co-directing with his wife and he was co-writing with a, a poet named Lewis Jenkins. And um, we had sections of the play that were improvised every single night. We didn't know what was going to happen, which was terrifying and hilarious because I, I at one point had to give a toast and my character um, was a, a, there's no easy way to say it. She was a, a Norse goddess who oh, had wow. been kidnapped by someone on earth and uh, she was sort of being held hostage in this sauna hut on a frozen lake during wow. ice fishing season. <laughs> <laughs> and she loved all things human and just wanted to um, to to be, you know, I guess to quote Arrow from The Little Mermaid, she wanted to be part of your world. And so, like, I had to give a toast every night and I would pull phrases from Britney Spears songs and nursery rhymes. And, like, I just wondered, you know, what this woman would co-opt from all of the, the vast... Uh, collection of human um you know poetry lyrics and all that to propose a toast and really my goal every night was just to get my castmates to crack um <laughs> and it was so much fun and on television man i've had so many formative experiences i mean that 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 monday morning series that you talked about we only got to do one season of it but it was such a wonderful show it was co-written by um uh, by Sanjay Gupta and uh, and I had such incredible actors on that show with me I mean I was working with Alfred Molina and Ving Rhames and Bill Irwin and uh, it was just a chance for me who'd never been a series regular on a TV show before um, to really learn the ropes from people who were so incredibly talented and so generous there was such generosity and collaboration on that set and that really just set the bar for everything that I, I have done since. And I've tried to bring that spirit of, of generosity to everything that I work on. And, and I've been encountered by other people who do the same. So I feel really fortunate. Very nice. Very interesting roles, I must say. <laughs> but it, yes, <laughs> I, I definitely haven't gotten stuck in a rut. Which is, which is nice. Yeah, definitely stepping out of your comfort zone. And let's talk about The Mandalorian. Fast forward today as your role as the armorer. Um, let's talk about the significance of your role as we see her more in uh, season three. Yes, um, I was thrilled when I, I found out what was going to be happening in season three and that she'd be turning up more. And I think that it was so powerful to have her be a part of this continued 
growth of the Mandalorian people and the continued exploration of these questions about, you know, what is the way? And, uh, and do you have to have all of the external trappings in order to really walk the way? And I love that they used a character like that to show that compromise is possible. That was one of the most powerful things to me about this season. Um, it was, I mean, it was so much fun for me to be able to be more involved with Din Djarin's journey and to get to interact with Grogu and get to team up with Bo-Katan. But at the core of it all, I just was so appreciative that they showed this willingness to compromise because I think, um, I mean, I think that that's something that we need to, to see exemplified in any form that we can. And even though it might be a story about this group of Mandalorians on a distant planet, you know, in a galaxy far, far away, there's still so much resonance for what we're going through as a society and in, in our culture right now. So it's always exciting to be part of storytelling like that. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to see your face in the series. Um, will we ever get to see the armorer's face? Because I know some of the other Mandalorians do take off their masks. I don't know <laughs> the answer to that question. I think it's so, I, I love for now that she has kept on her helmet. I think it's really right for the character and it makes it so much easier for me when I get to set because I don't have to do hair and makeup. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I'm sure that if they have her remove her helmet, it will be for a very, very good reason. So we'll just have to wait and see what that is. Mm -hmm. And for our viewers that are not familiar with The Mandalorian, of course, most people are. Tell us a little bit about the series. Yes. Well, the series takes place um, in the midst of, I mean, timeline wise, in the midst of the original three uh, Star Wars movies. And it was really based off of um, originally Boba Fett and the idea of, you know, this Mandalorian bounty hunter. Um, and so a lot of fans, when they heard the series announced, thought it was going to be about Boba Fett, but it was he was really just the inspiration for it. And The Mandalorian, I think, I think one of the reasons that we had connect to Din Djarin so immediately is uh, he presents himself as this, this total Lone Ranger. Um, and, you know, we've seen that character before in, in so many Westerns, um, in Star Wars itself in the past. And there is just something that's so relatable about this guy who doesn't really trust anybody else. And he's just trying to get through on his own. Um, and I've heard it described as a, as a space Western. I think that that's really appropriate. And he stumbles upon, um, in one of his, his bounty hunts, this adorable little green-eared guy who <laughs> everybody in the world knows by now, Grogu. And he just can't deny that, that he feels a connection to this helpless creature and he starts to feel this purpose that he's called to that is bigger than his need to isolate and to be alone and so that sort of uh, kicks him off on his journey and it's it's really the it's the hero's journey that we have come to love in Star Wars movies and so there's there are incredible threads that connect it to the other movies and to the animated series like Clone Wars but there's also a completely unique element to it that makes it so accessible to people who've never even seen Star Wars. I mean, I have so many friends who had never watched any Star Wars content before and they love the show. And sometimes it means that that means they're going to take off on a, you know, on a, they're going to go down the rabbit hole and start <laughs> watching everything. Um, but I think that it's so accessible to people who, who know nothing about Star Wars and it's so rich in Easter yeah. eggs for people that have loved those movies and those TV shows for many, many, many years. And, and one of the greatest thrills for me is that it does span so many generations in terms of the fandom. I get to meet grandparents who are watching with their grandkids and people my age who grew up with Star Wars now have kids that they get to watch with. And it's so joyful that way. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that when I do watch the series, uh, which I just watched it last night, is I watch it with my, my parents, my niece, my nephew, and you're right, it has such a diverse yeah. fan base, which is amazing. And I have to talk about Grogu. I know a lot of people think he's Baby Yoda, but I heard he's he's not. He's, he's uh, a different character he's altogether, not. right? <laughs> he just, it was easy to start calling him that because at first he didn't have a name, and he looks like a baby Yoda, but no, he is he is not baby Yoda. He is his own his own unique person <laughs> and we have a lot to learn about his story still. 
Very cute. And I want to ask you, Emily, how has it been working with such an iconic brand like Star Wars? And of course, with Pedro Pascal, who's also rose to fame over the last uh, few years. That guy is everywhere. Yeah, um, exactly. It's, I mean, it's incredible. I have, I have nothing to compare it to that even comes close. Um, Pedro, I actually knew from my New York theater days. Oh, and wow. so, and then I worked with him on, on The Mentalist for a few episodes. Wow. So it was really, really exciting to get to, um, you know, you never know when you're going to get to work with people repeatedly when you're an actor because you don't have that much control over who you're working with. And so it's been delightful to get to work with him and, and so exciting to see all of the things that he's doing these days. Um, and being a part of Star Wars, I feel like it just gets better and better the more I get to know the fan community and the more, um, the more I get to see just how many lives it has touched and how much it's influenced storytelling in other movies since its creation, you know, over 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a really, really special thing to be a part of because I think it, it is a centerpiece of, of um, one of our storytelling uh, myths, I guess, as a, as a society. You know, it, it's been around for so long and it just touches on these deeply relatable um, dreams and aspirations that we all have. And, uh, and to get to see how that impacts people is just, it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, congratulations, by the way. That's You have such an iconic role and it must be wonderful being part of such an iconic brand. So congratulations on all your success, by the way. <laughs> and I wanna talk about the armorer's voice. She has such a powerful, oh, distinct yeah. voice. How do you get into character for that? Is that your real voice? That is my wow. real voice. Um, as you have <laughs> seen by now, I am a much more animated person <laughs> than, <laughs> than the armor is, but that's one of the reasons that I love playing her. I mean, it, I when I am inhabiting her space, I just feel so grounded and I feel so centered and m so calm. And I think that there's a real patience to her and a real trust. I think that that her willingness to go more slowly and to um, and to remain so calm until she needs to beat up some stormtroopers <laughs> comes from a real sense of trust and in faith and things happening um, in a natural order. And as for the voice itself, I mean, it 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 started in the audition because the only audition, the only information that I had was that she was a Zen-like leader. And so I felt like somebody who was Zen-like would, you know, be a little lower in her voice and, and talk more slowly. Um, and the British-ish dialect happened because when I was auditioning, apparently they were seeing a lot of British actresses. And so they asked me to do a take of the scene with that dialect. And then we kept it because John liked how that set her apart from everyone else because she does sort of seem to be, she, she's sort of timeless and you can't pin her down. And so it's kind of nice to have a slightly different way of speaking for her. Um, but yes, that is that is my voice. I mean, it's the sound is somewhat impacted by being inside a helmet, but they just have a, a mic in there to capture the dialogue while we're shooting. And uh, as far as I know, they don't do anything to it to change it. Amazing. It's a very powerful voice. I feel like your Broadway experience really helped with the voice because it's it's powerful and distinct. So I got so. a good set of lungs on me. I'm good at <laughs> I'm good at being loud and projecting, but also uh, you know, just being very grounded and making sure I'm supporting my voice. So maybe all that goes into it. <laughs> and I want to talk about I saw a clip where you were at the fan expo and you got to take off your mask and meet your fans. So how was that meeting the fans and revealing yourself? <laughs> oh man, that was such a riot because, uh, you know, usually at these conventions, all of the fans come dressed up, but the actors themselves don't dress up. And uh, I had some friends who are members of the 501st um, in the Cleveland area, and they're incredible um, costume builders. And so they built me an armorer costume. And I mean, I couldn't say no when they offered <laughs> it. And then. Uh, Brett and Araya Fisher are their names, and they had the idea for me to go kind of undercover in my costume because 
nobody would expect it because they're you know usually you see cosplayers at the convention and it, it's it's anybody except the actual actor who does the role so nobody expected me to be there it was uh in the hours before the convention itself actually opened because we were there to sort of keep morale up for people who had gotten up early and were waiting in line um and it was such a hoop because you know there we were sort of ribbing them the the fans who were waiting in line and and uh you know i was offering my autograph to people and and nobody knew that it was actually me so they just yeah. thought i was some cheeky cosplayer who was like hey i'll sign that for you <laughs> and then i think there were probably some people confused when i took off my helmet because there are still a lot of people who don't know what i look like so yeah. So it doesn't matter if they see my face, but it was it was so much fun. And now every convention I've done since then, people ask me, you know, they say, are you going to do it again? Or they say that they've been eyeing other armorers suspiciously because they don't mm -hmm. know if it's me. So uh, I will do it again at some point, but I, I won't reveal when or where. I have to say, when you took off your mask, you were you were still beautiful and calm and collective. I feel like I would be dying of heat with a huge mask like that. There How are do you the stay cool? Moments. I mean, it totally depends on the climate of of you know wherever you're you're wearing it, inside or outside. There were days on set that got so hot and sweaty, and days when we were out in the sun. And then there were night shoots where it was freezing out, and so I was kind of glad to have you know my fur and my helmet, and it, it kept me warm in there. Mm, very nice. And Emily, I created my platform to inspire, to motivate, and to show success stories like yours. So I want to ask you, for any of our viewers watching this that are going through a hard time, maybe they're feeling low, maybe you know they're not seeing success in their careers, but they're putting in the work, what would you say to motivate and inspire them? Oh, wow. Well, I really, really relate to that feeling of putting in a lot of work and not seeing success. Um, I mean, I think it just goes with being creative that there's going to be a lot of uh, rejection that you have to that you have to take. And even, you know, even since doing The Mandalorian, I still audition for so many things that I don't get that I would love to do. So it just sort of goes with the territory. Um, and for me, what's really helped is is getting very specific about what my idea is of success, because um, I have found that in this business, the being dedicated and being talented are just sort of like the foundation that you have to have. And beyond that, you have no control over what job opportunities you're actually going to get. And it that doesn't necessarily mean anything about how talented you are. So for me, Whenever I work on auditions, whenever I work on a project, I really have to identify what within that is meaningful to me and how I can see it helping me grow as an actor, as a person, um, how it's impacting people around me. The more that I, and, and by the way, this comes from uh, people like I, I met on Monday morning, seeing them be of service to the people around them in creating, um, I find when I do that, it puts so much less pressure on me to worry about whether or not people like me, whether or not I'm good. When you're feeling discouraged, when you feel like, you know, you're just throwing stuff against the wall and nothing's hitting, um, what helps me is to see how I can connect more to other people, whether that means um, collaborating with somebody on a project or, um, you know, inviting people to come see work in a different way or seeing if I have friends who need help with things that they're working on because it can, it's funny because for something that is all about communicating and all about community, it can feel very isolated sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more that you can connect to your creative community and, and, uh, and open your mind to what, what it means to create and, um, you know, how you can get your ideas out there. Because sometimes just by being willing to help somebody else with a project, it inspires something in you and then you're you're rolling again in a new way. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, when you talk to other people in the community and your industry, you realize that you're not alone. Everyone is kind of going through yeah. the same struggles, right? They're all, you know, grinding day in and day out. And, you know, all of a sudden they see success, but, you know, they have to keep going. So I like that. And I like that you said about rejection because I think that's so important because I think so many people, they see someone like you on TV and, you know, they think that it's easy, but it's it's not. It takes a long oh, time, right, to get to where you are. So I well, like that you shared that. People ask me a lot. Uh, they say, how, how did you decide to do Star Wars? <laughs> and 
I tell them the truth, which is, you know, the year. So I auditioned for it, I think, in maybe August of 2018. And that year, I probably auditioned for a hundred different things yeah. and got maybe two or three of them. And one of them was The Mandalorian. So, yeah. you know, I, I have had this tremendous success with this one thing. Um, and I'm so grateful for that, but that doesn't mean that I don't still face rejection over and over and over and over. And, uh, and so it helps me to know that other people go through that too, because it, it normalizes it. It's not, it's not me. It's, it's yeah. all of us who are trying to create. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? Rejection is, is, it's not a bad thing. You know, it just helps you to stay motivated, right? I know mm -hmm. when I get a no, I just want to work harder and I, I want to prove myself. So sometimes no just means that you're trying. That means, you know, you're doing the auditions, you're putting in the work. A no means you're trying. And sometimes you just need that one yes, right? Like you, you got that yes, yes and that blows up your career. And yeah. So thank you, Emily, so much for sharing that. I think it's going to be very inspirational for our audience. And I want to ask you, what are your current projects? What else are you working on? Well, these days <laughs> I have been all over the place doing fan conventions for the most part, um, which I love. I get to travel all over the country, all over Canada, all over the world. I'm going to Australia next week. Um, and there's a little bit of a, a lull right now because of the writer strike. So there's nothing new that I'm working on at the moment that I can talk about. Um, I just did a voiceover for a, uh, an animated project that I'm excited about, but I, that's all I can say. And uh, I'm also part of a short film that's making the festi festival circuit right now called The Marked. And that actually goes back to what we were just talking about with creating because it, it was it's a first time directing project by a friend of mine who's an actor. And um, he had written this, feature length script that he wanted to get done, but had no idea how to get the money he would need. And a friend encouraged him to make a short that was sort of a proof of concept of the film. First time doing this. And he's already won some directing awards at these festivals. We've won some acting awards as a cast. Um, and so I'm excited to see what happens with that. And that is called The Marked. And you can't see it right now, but hopefully you will be able to soon. Or I guess you could if it's at a, a festival near where you are for anyone who goes to, to short film festivals. Um, but that was just such motivation for me and so exciting to see his, you know, he was feeling frustrated and and put something together for his friends to be in and it's done tremendously well. Hmm, I'm going to keep my eye out for that. But Emily, thank you so much for being on the show today. Congratulations yeah. again on all your success. I'm such a big fan of the show and your character. So Congratulations, and I'm really excited to see what Thank else you. is in store for you. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it so much. Thanks for taking the time. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.